And uh, Gene Dante's here, and I'm here, and let's see. There we go. We've got a radio TV show going. Welcome to uh, welcome to Visual Radio. Oh, thank you. So we're on that camera. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's just a moment. We look like a morning duo for a <laughs> classic rock station, Love you know. Um, the New England, the Endicott Review. So, so you've experienced a half hour of our show. Is it kind of? It's not Howard Stern, so it's it's okay. It's I'm okay with that. I mean, yeah. Howard's got his thing going on, but uh, I like the eclectic music. I like what I hear, which is great. Movie reviews were fun. Come on, that's it's entertaining. A little bit of local politics. It's always good, right? Uh, Frank Delostrito has like three books out. He has a fourth coming out. He's from Texas, and I was in the horror music world. So uh, Frankie has been doing the reviews with me for like five, six years now. That's great. Yeah, so I said we should have one of our um, people out there um, take the reviews and transcribe them and put a book out because it'll be his fifth book. Oh, yeah, that's perfect. But I, I don't think... Um, Frank won't listen to our show so we can talk about him and he won't hear it because he doesn't want to hear his own voice, but it's our voices. So let's let's do a typical... What all the DJs do, what's your next gig? Uh, we are playing actually Saturday night right here in beautiful downtown Union Square, Summer Follette, Sally O'Brien's. We're on early, 9 o'clock. We're kicking off the, uh, the early slash late show. <laughs> so uh, with our, our buddies Modern Day Idols and the Dirty Dotties. And uh, I love playing Sally O'Brien's because it's a... Tiny Little Irish Pub, right across the street from another Tiny Little Irish Pub, down the street from a third Tiny Little Irish Pub, and I like it. Being an Italian, going to an Irish pub, you know how it is. So what time do you go on? We're on at 9 o'clock sharp. So anyone who listened to the radio show earlier, we started off with the love letter is dead. I don't agree. <laughs> so let's talk about the love letter is dead. Sure. <laughs> Maybe from your perspective. Well, uh... The song in particular or the concept itself? <laughs> Both. Tell us. Uh, well, us. I always say that any time a, a songwriter tells you it's just a song, they're really, they're lying. So, uh, but uh, that song was written in particular because it was just about people, uh, people, maybe me, uh, wasting their time uh, waiting for somebody to return their affections and uh, rather than just kind of going with it. And, um, and the concept in general is like, I mean, you see these old movies where people sent letters or our grandparents wrote each other letters. I remember a very romantic story where my grandmother told me how my grandfather uh, used to write her letters when he was uh, in World War II and, uh, and about how they would get married and, you know, they were always very excited about it. And uh, so that kind of, I feel like texts and emails, you know, it's, it, it's a new world, but it's uh, there's something, something about having that piece of paper that, uh, that kind of tactile sense and the handwriting of somebody you care about that's it seems to be lost um, not saying it's for better or for worse but there's something special about it that I, I think is uh, maybe fading away love can make people insane so there can be like insane letters written that people want to take back ten years later <laughs> there's uh, definitely some of that and I hope none of mine ever surface there you go so uh, <laughs> you know it's it's uh the, do you know the, the movie The Object of My Affection? I do not. No. Okay, so that's about um, Paul Rudd being this gay guy and um, what's her name? Wait, Paul Later. Rudd's gay? No, he's straight, but he plays a gay guy in the movie. What? No, I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> but the author the author lives in Cambridge and he's been on the show. I've got to have him back. He, he's an amazing man. So you think he's gay? Oh, I don't know. Is Come he on. hot? I'm just um, teasing. Do you want me to introduce him? <laughs> And, and it's weird, I'm reading this poetry book, and In the Closet pops up. So, I mean, you know, we're getting, we're getting out there, people. All right, so the object of my affection um, has um, Jessica, what's her name there, uh, the blonde? Um, Jessica. Jessica Lang? <clears throat> no, but uh, I'm, Younger, older? I know these things. She's a... Um, Tandy. She's always getting Alba. divorced from Brad Pitt and, and oh. this. Oh, um, Jessica. Uh, Je it begins with J. Jennifer. Jennifer uh, Aniston? Jennifer Aniston. 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 She Aniston. just married uh, Justin Thoreau, I believe, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think they're probably getting divorced according to the supermarket tabloids, uh, but I don't read them. I just <laughs> see them. Uh, her house is uh, amazing, so um, I'm sure she's never lonely, even though the tabloids say otherwise. Uh, so she 
um, Tim Daly is the boyfriend of Paul Rudd in okay. the movie. And Tim Daly is a teacher who's sleeping with one of his students. So he, and so Jennifer Aniston hears that he needs an apartment and he doesn't even know it yet. He moves in with her and she falls in love with him. And he falls in love with someone else and there's the, uh, but the book is a lot different. Uh, however, the, the movie um, makes some poignant notes and the late, oh, there's a late actor in there and I know all these names but I'm, um, sometimes, look, I just turned 63. <laughs> so I, you know, um, the, the, the older actor, great actor, he really brings some greatness to the film because he makes all these poignant things about you can't um, you, you can't choose who you fall in love with, and he's giving her advice even though he doesn't want to. He's a film critic, so it's a, check the movie out. It's oh. it's um it's a series of vignettes, and it could have been a lot better, but it, it's passable. It works because the 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 book it came from is great, and the actors do a good job. Just a series of vignettes. Now, do you do videos? Do you do video vignettes? Uh, well, we make music videos for the for the. Songs. We have a third uh, video from our latest singles coming out. Um, Girl in Unicycle will be out hopefully within 30 days. I have to, I have to find out from the publicist when that shit's getting uh, when that stuff is getting out. Um, and then we just shot a video for Hand Me Erasers. We have one. Our latest, uh, the last video we released is for We Are All Whores, and uh, that's been out for over a year now. So it's time for some new stuff to come out. Uh, and then, now We Are All Whores, and you did the whore song that David Bowie wrote. Yeah, no, yeah, I seem to have a theme going on there. I feel like, yeah, uh, maybe, maybe there's something reoccurring there. You know, Johnny Ray in 1954, on May 8th, he was banned in the UK for a song, and it's so innocuous today. But, of course, that was 63 years ago. Yes. Hey, you can get in trouble for showing your ankles and, and happen to be a, a woman back in the puritanical days, correct? Um, I mean, we weren't there, but... No, but... <laughs> um... Interesting. I've never done this Facebook Live with the studio camera, so this will be interesting. Are you seeing it on? Is it on Boston Free Radio? I haven't seen it yet. So oh, that camera is showing this. No, no, that camera is a whole different oh, thing. So the iPads. If you go outside, you'll see us on TV. We're on Channel Three. We're trimal casting. We're on radio online. We're on Facebook Live video, and we're on video on TV. Channel Three Somerville. So you're getting maximum exposure as much as we can do. It's impossible to not get my bad side, um, <laughs> which is my voice. <laughs> but um, uh, controversial stuff, you know, the, the word, it's, it's just I'm interested. Do people get all bent out of shape with that word on a Wednesday afternoon on TV? I don't think so. It's cable. It might, I don't know. Well, yeah, maybe not this one. Hopefully not. But hopefully they don't. I don't know. Do you ever read Metro? Do you get on the train? Do you ever read Metro? Does anyone read this thing? Uh, I used to. I haven't been on the train in a while, I mean, uh, but uh, I haven't read anything recently. You know, the Boston Globe buys it out, and it's like all the media is just so consolidated. Like uh, my friend Bobby that you know called on the phone, he was like railing about the Medford newspaper. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's true that the um, one paper went under, the Medford Mercury, I wrote a Rogue One Star Wars review in December. Mm -hmm. They gave me like all of page three. It was impressive. And they've been around 180 years and they go out of business. And it's like, like Tower Records, why can't you reinvent yourself? Now, do you know Tower is there in Japan? Really? So records are still a viable business? The last one, Tokyo, right? Is it the last one? I believe so. And it's like bigger than Macy's? Mm -hmm. It's like huge? This is what I hear. I mean, I don't need the headphones because I can just talk and just trust the machinery, but... Have you seen that documentary, Tower Records? No. It's amazing. So Dan Murphy is telling us about the uh, documentary on Tower. Um, but why wouldn't Tower reinvent itself so that Gene Dante can have a... Like I used to have, you know, in, in the record stores, you know, my own little bin. Well, we're talking about business. Every business has its cycle. They certainly ramped it up at Tower Records, but when it went down, it went down hard, so... They, they stayed online, right? I believe they did, yes. But when you've got Amazon and you've got eBay, how do you compete when you're a brick and mortar? You really can't because you don't have those kind of overheads. The only way, and, and uh, I believe I heard this from one of the guys running Newbury Comics, was, and then you've, 
you've got superstores muscling in on the specifically muscling in on the CD business where they use CDs as a loss leader, where you can get the new Lady Gaga album for like eight bucks versus a smaller retail where you can't negotiate that kind of price. And they use those things to lure you in so they can sell a bunch of cheap underwear or whatever home goods they're selling. You know, and so a store like, you know, and, and somebody call me out here, a store like Newbury Comics has to diversify and sell interesting clothing or interesting tchotchkes or gimmicks or, and, and, of course, comic books. 420 stuff. Yeah, 420 stuff, right. You've got to, but you've got to diversify. A big company can't, especially when 95% of your business is one st style of product and you're losing, you're bleeding customers to online and to superstores, you might not be as nimble as a smaller business or like an online business where all they have to do is find a distributor and they can just pop it up on their website and suddenly, you know, really the, the key is fulfillment, but they can certainly sell it. Power started off as a flea market record thing, Joe. You literally were selling records at flea markets. And it got so big, you know, they grew into a small grocery store. And then, you know, so they started in the age when it was pretty much records, you know, because Elton John was a great part of that documentary where Elton John's in there buying records, going out of style, dressed as Captain Fantastic, you know what I mean? And I think the CD and the digital stuff, they just didn't prepare for it. And that's what happened to them. And it's a jungle now, but I have two points on this. And um, one is, like Amy Mann's happy not having a record deal. She likes doing it on her own. You as an artist... What do you do? Is it CD Baby and TuneCore? Is that your avenue? Right now it's, uh, it's Bandcamp, CD Baby. Um, we, we are lucky enough that we uh, anything I release because of CD Baby can come out on iTunes as well. Um, you know, someone like an Amy Mann, well, she's very lucky that she existed during the time when record labels could push out and would push out an alternative artist who wasn't a former... Mickey Mouse Club participant and actually had something interesting and cool to say. Till Tuesday was considered alternative rock in the day when labels actually came to Boston and looked at bands and signed them. And they, she was able to make a sustainable career out of it. And so she's very fortunate. But to say, oh, I'm so glad I don't have a record label, well, try starting out that way before you start saying that. It's like Francis Ford Coppola opening, vint, you know, opening his vineyard and his winery and saying that maybe artists shouldn't get paid. Well, you were around when they did, so I don't think you really have a, you know, any way to say that without already being biased. You built yourself on your movie career, you made millions of dollars, and now it's okay to say that other artists shouldn't make a living? I don't think that's cool. But for as far as Amy goes, she, again, she benefited from the industry that existed, and now it doesn't, but she's already a household name. So somebody starting out, really at this point, I, my advice would be make YouTube videos cheap and short and get out there and get capitalize on that market and then, you know, have that as a way to introduce your, your songs and your interesting uh, statements. It doesn't have to be clown work. It can be something artistic. It absolutely can. I mean, it doesn't, it just, you really have to find out what's going on. Don't chase a trend, but a medium Mediums are going to change one day. Who knows? It might be a pill we take and we experience the song. I don't really, I can't predict the future. <laughs> I'm trying to find us on Facebook Live. I can't. I can't either. Um, That's all right. If you know. guys want to talk for a second, I'm going to go out and get some help. <laughs> okay. Um, so. But we are on the air, correct? You are on the air. Um, <laughs> Yeah, because I'd like to make sure that we, we get um, that we get the feed so that we can uh, have some fun. They're actually we're there. They're just censoring us. Um, <laughs> no, but talk about the bands on the bill at um, at Sally O'Brien's, and I'll be right back. All right, great. And talk to Dan about it. And I will. Dan, take Murphy. over the show. Yes. Let's take over the show. Thanks for your show, Joe. Yeah, thanks. We'll 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 take care of it. Honestly, I get to monitor the TV screen out here. We are. Uh, so, we've got a little few things to say before we go uh, return to our martini lunch. Anyway, here we are on Boston Free Radio. Saturday night, uh, you can catch me and my fabulous band, The Future Starlets, at Sally O'Brien's in Union Square. We are on at 9 o'clock sharp, uh, first of three bands. Uh, we wanted to go on early so we could hang out with you people and have a nightcap while we enjoy the Dirty Dotties and the Modern Day Idols. It's a really cheap 
ticket price, five bucks, gets you all that and uh, some hang time with your man GD and future starlets as well. So hopefully you can join us. Um, and uh, we've basically, we've got a, a show a month coming up for the rest of the summer. We'll be heading down to New York uh, next month, June 24th. We're playing at the Delancey in uh, all the way down in New York City. So we're really excited about that. We're also going to be part of the uh, Midway Cafe's Dirty 30 celebration uh, in July. So you should definitely check it out. Joe's back. He's got a phone in his hand. Yeah, we're on live. We're thing. on live. Boston Free Radio. We're so uh, this is exciting. Uh, we're all over the map, people, which is great. Sally O'Brien's uh, is right near PA's Lounge, so that's a unique, a unique thing. And you know the thing about Union Square, you've got grooves. Have you been there? No, I've not. Oh, put a poster up of the grooves today. Oh, where are you parked, you guys? <laughs> right outside. I am too. That's my car there, right near the woman who's putting money in the meter. <laughs> um, I watch it. They gave me a ticket a couple of weeks ago when I had money in the meter. I was ripping, so I, I, I Xerox it, I, you know, the ticket, the, the sticker that I paid, and about a month later I get this one-time only courtesy, we're going to, courtesy, I didn't do anything wrong. It's yeah, the mayor, Joe. It's, it's yeah. the mayor. Mayor Curtitone's all right. He takes care of us here. So we'd like Curtitone. Well, I'm sorry, I was thinking of your, to Medford, man. Yeah, no, she, Stephanie Doth. She's Steph out of her jurisdiction. <laughs> Just because I, I nicknamed her Doth Stephanie, and Bob said, don't do that. <laughs> But it's just so really for Darth Stephanie. Did it stick? Oh yeah. <laughs> well, see, everything I do, the blog, my blog, uh, MedfordInfoCentral.com, is reaching about a million hits. Okay. Where do you do a blog of a city and do you get a million hits? Yeah, it's true. Yeah. They're very upset with City Hall. So, like, the, the natives are restless and they go into my blog because I was saying this about the local media, the, the newspaper, Medford Transcript. I wrote for them. Um, they got all these pop-up ads. The pop-ups are beyond annoying. It's one of the worst gatehouse media, one of the worst um, ways of driving away, of getting an audience, because it's the best way to drive away an audience. The pop-ups are fast and furious, and who wants to? So my blog, you just go to the blog, and what do I give you? Public records requests. Oh, here's what the chief, the chief of police is making. You know, and, and I videotaped the chief of police last week uh, at his, they have a once a month thing to get together. It's all fluff. And he's got 17 officers in the room. Oh, and they're here on their own time. No, they're not. It was at the Medford Housing Authority. There's a police car and it's running. So obviously the guy's on the clock. And so the blog gives that information and people go to it. But we're like 25,000 away from 1 million. Wow. We do like 500 a day, sometimes 1,000. That's great. And Those during great the election numbers. we're getting 3,000 a day, which is this 1,440 minutes in a day. So we were getting three hits a minute, or two hits a minute, which is ins insane. That's great numbers. But we, we put stuff about, we, we put physical documents um, up, and that's why the mayor's upset with me, because we're actually getting traction. But to not talk to me, yeah, we, we've been friendly over the years, very friendly over the years. Now she's mayor, she's, I'm mayor of all people, no. no not when you're doing your Marie Osmond thing, I, I, I. Yeah, th that's a big thing now, is people taking someone's, you know, words and, and adding up how many times they say a certain word to see if there's a trend, and it, it, I think it does speak volumes to what their perspective is and, you know, what their focus is on, you know, and, and how, how big their vocabulary is. At least she's not saying like, like a valley girl. Oh. Well, Gene well, Dante, Gene Dante running for mayor, okay? Gene, I want to hear about the broken streets. And when you're going to fix them? I want to, why, why do you have seven million in the water and sewer and, and the pipe, the infrastructure is breaking down? Uh, if you were a mayor, you would have that information. You would think you would. Or your, whoever your captains or your chiefs are in charge of infrastructure, in charge of, you know, uh, resources. I don't know exactly how it works, you know, but I would think that you'd want to be on that or at least keep a document with you so if you can't remember, you'd know. The reason they leave seven million up to nine million in water and sewer is because... They want a double-A rating so that they can say Medford has a double-A bond rating. Yeah, but your infrastructure is falling apart. Yeah, you can't have that. You have I to know have safe roads. And... No, but Somerville is, is coming around. Now, you know the Green Line is going to come in here. Yeah. How, I... They're going to fork off the way it forks off near Heinz Auditorium into three separate entities. Okay. So if I take the train, I, I park my car like at Wellington, I take the train into the movies. Yeah. It forks off, and you can pick one of the three that'll go get you to the theater. 
two of the three will get me close to the Fenway Theater, that old Sears robot. Oh, yeah, yeah, thing. yeah. So, um, if, I do, if I go that route instead of taking the car in, um, it forks off now for you as an artist, the green line coming here to Sally O'Brien's and PA's. Now it's like, now you're on the same playing field as Cantab. I have a mixed, um, I have a mixed feeling about that because, number one, I think the public transit system is essential for any city uh, and for any urban area because I, I just think it's safer. You have less people driving cars after drinking um, and it's just convenient to get people to go around because, let's face it, driving in the city is a pain in the ass. But also, now I also heard that there are going to be homes that are displaced due to imminent domain. And I don't know how much I like that if somebody's house has been there for 30 years and now they're being told they have to move to make way. And for the people who stand by and let people lose their homes because it's more convenient, I think those people, well, you'll be next. And I don't think that, uh, I don't think you should be, you know, removing people's homes because of bad urban planning. But... I'm also torn because I think more public transportation is definitely necessary um, in this the way this city is becoming more and more sprawling. So, the date again of Sally O'Brien's is this Saturday? It is this Saturday. Lucky Saturday the 13th. Okay, and at Saturday the 13th, we have going on at Malden Access TV about 20 bands playing. Wow. They have the annual party, and it's May 13th this year, so Soy Casey uh, is going to be performing and other people at Malden TV, so then they can all come over to Sally O'Brien's. Come on night. down. What time do you guys start the Malden TV thing? With 20 bands, I would think that that starts early. That's, would you call it a festival? Uh, it is a kind of a music fest, and uh, Sway's going on at 7 o'clock. When do you go on? We are on at 9. At 9, that's a cool time, so they can, that's the, about the time the Malden thing ends. So, um, you know, if come you have flyers, down. I can bring them over there. I, would, I will get you some. <laughs> yeah. And what I suggest, you and Dan, if you park right here, go to Grooves Records. Do you know Mickey Bliss um, was the DJ that opened the place? They had oh, a great. DJ. I love Mickey. Yeah, oh, wonderful. So he, um, they had a DJ spinning. It was Mickey Bliss and Grooves open. It's a great vinyl record store, and it's right near Sally O'Brien. So I think if you put a poster, they got tons of posters in the windows of upcoming live oh, acts. Well, it's it's so good that vinyl is making a comeback. Vinyl is delicious. The Our, art, the sound, it's fun. I don't know if you know Joe, but I do touring work, professional touring work. No, with, with big band. I've been with Rob Thomas and Matchbox 20 for about 70 years now. And I see these musicians on days off just going crazy looking for vinyl record stores. Now, Rob Thomas, does he do movie soundtracks? He does a little bit here and there. I'm not sure about movie soundtracks. Uh, he, he pretty much keeps it real with his solo band and Matchbox. Being a tech, you know, on stage, I don't really have a lot of access to the other stuff he does, but I'm not... There, I'm not there. I'm home doing other stuff. Because um, Rob Zombie, Rob Thomas, one of these guys took Dracula or Frankenstein. I'm trying to, I was trying to look it up last night. I, I doubt that's Rob Thomas. <laughs> it okay. sounds more like Rob Zombie than Rob Zombie. Sounds like Mr. Zombie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Haverhill's finest. Yeah. <laughs> but Matchbox 20 are in movies. They've got soundtrack songs. Oh, well, song. Oh, yeah. I'm sure, sure. sure. Yeah. 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 Because... They've been around a while now. I would have to Google it. We have an hour. Let me do that right now. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, well, we we have um, we actually have only thirty six minutes left. So you see, only <laughs> actually minutes. less than that, thirty thirty three. But um, I told you it's fun. It's just you know time goes, and we're talking. So how how did you start? Uh, well, uh, and where? <laughs> how and where did you start? I. It's funny, uh, you should ask that. I mean, well, my interest in music, you mean like all the way back when I was young? Or? Yeah, yes. Oh, what was well, the first instrument you picked up? Uh, it was definitely, uh, it was supposed to be piano. And um, as a 13-year-old kid who is quirky and awkward and already on the outs with the, most of the kids at school, learning piano wasn't exactly a very rock and roll thing to do. So after about two or three weeks of that, I, I stopped taking lessons and I begged my parents to help me get a guitar. I did, and uh, you know, started learning chords and stuff. But uh, I wanted to be, you know, my, my first records were Queen, News of the World, and Kiss Alive too. and I wanted to do that. You know, I didn't want to play, you know, little scales on the piano. I wanted to crank up my Exactly. <laughs> we By all the way, did. we have a guitar here, Joe. <laughs> um, if you want to play something, 
I'm not going to bore you. <laughs> no, no, but um, answer my questions first. Sure, sure. Please, I'm here. And uh, so, yeah, and then, I mean, I wouldn't be seen in a band until like the mid-90s. My first band was called Jet Velvet Trash, and uh, I always say that I started out wanting to be Brian Eno and ended up being Paul Stanley, and I, I, I kind of continued that way. But uh, so, you I know, mean, I've been playing in bands since then, and, uh, and then finally it was time to have my own band. You know, I, was, I would end up doing most of the writing anyway, and I said, you know, well, why, why should my name be in front? And, you know, I'll, I'll bear the brunt of the criticism if I'm writing, and, you know, I'm lucky enough to have people that are actually super talented that want to play with me, so that's kind of nice. Well, who's in the band right now? Uh, the band right now is, uh, my, our lead guitar player is uh, Scott Petalano. He was in the band Missile Thrush, which gets together every blue moon. Um, they were... Uh, they were on a major label for a while, and they're uh, they're kind of big around Boston. Uh, my bass player is a guy named Jim Collins, who's also playing a few other acts. Jim is one of the greatest harmony singers and uh, helps a lot with the arrangements, along with all of the band. Um, my drummer is Tamara Gooding, who's uh, currently playing with Megan Tracy's band, The Misconnections, and also plays in Axe Monkey and uh, is a fabulous drummer and our rhythm guitar player. Is, uh, we call him Ace, but his name is Eric Anderson, and he is uh, he's out of New York and um, kind of holds the fort down, also sings with me. So I'm pretty lucky I get these guys. It's kind of, I've seen other Boston guys who are like, you know, out front of their own bands. Everybody's a little bit on loan, you know what I mean? Because people got to do their own thing too. The great Eric Anderson is not your guitar player. No, very. Uh, it's it's funny that you had said that earlier, and I was like, wow, that's kind of an, a popular name, I guess. So uh, so we, we call him Ace. Sometimes we call him, when he does something wrong, we call him Chris. That's, that's who gets blamed when something, something goes wrong in the band, Chris. But uh, yeah, Eric Anderson. Or I joke and I say we should call him Anders Erickson, but he, I don't think... I'd like that, yeah. <laughs> but um, Eric Anderson, um, who is Lou Reed's friend, he... Great folky. He's out in Northampton on, I believe it's Friday night, with my friend Eric Lee playing violin or maybe guitar. I'm not sure what Eric's going to play. Nice. Uh, Eric was just in town at the Cantab. On, he did a residency on the Monday nights. Uh, you can see up there Eric Lee and friends. He'd bring in different friends and he would um, have them perform, almost like a Pasim thing at the Cantab. That's great. So uh, when he said he's playing with Eric Anderson, I'm like, whoa, and I thought it was next month, and I look, <laughs> and it's this Friday, and it's like, boy, but the trek to Northampton, I'd love to go, but it's just so you got to spend the night. It's, it's two if hours. If you're going to go all the way, yeah, yeah. if you're going to go out there, you might, and you might as well enjoy it. Northampton's beautiful. So, you know, make it about, a, it's a destination concert. It's not just whipping over to a club and whipping back home. You, you literally got to turn that into a night. Plan a dinner, spend the night, enjoy oh. Northampton, have breakfast, and then come home. I would want Eric Anderson to let me Facebook him live, and you know, if if I got permission, maybe I'd take the trek out because that was that's what I like to do. Yeah, you know. well, make, make a bit of it, you know, if, if he's down with it. <laughs> so, have you played uh, Club Bohemia in a while? You know what? I haven't, and that's when it's funny that you said the Cantab because I I knew Mickey years ago when it was at the Kirkland Cafe, which is. I don't know what that's called now. It's still the Kirkland, but it's not. It's, it's a something restaurant, different, but yeah. it's not what it was. But uh, it's funny because I've gone to the Kent Tavern. Every show I've seen in that basement, I've loved, and I, I really love the vibe there. I love that. I love that they serve Miller High Life, which is one of my favorites. But I also love. I don't know why there's is something. I always say I just get a Max's Kansas City vibe from it because of the way this. Every time I've gone, I've seen people I know, and the bands and the sound has been great, and it's just a. There's enough of an element of cool and danger that I think it's uh, it's a venue I want to play at. I'm cool kind of... and danger, I like yeah. that. Maybe I'll use it. I'm the promo guy, so you maybe may. I'll use it in the. Uh... <laughs> Please do, and <laughs> let me know if I can get an in with somebody over there. <laughs> uh, just call Mickey. I would love to. I'd love you know, to play over there. Um, that is a great venue. Mickey Mickey Bliss is very presidential, as we are here at the station. Heather Heather Mack and I were talking about it a little earlier. We're very presidential here, where we. Um, we play everything and everyone. I mean, look at the shows. Yeah, it's crazy. I love it. A lot of color. It's reminding me of that uh, the last Wizard of Oz movie. That's very colorful. Yeah, that movie was kind of strange. <laughs> Is um, it Oz the Great and Powerful? Is that the one you're... 
Yeah, and you know, the guy who played the actor, um, James... James Franco? Franco from the Spider-Man series, he yeah. is a better actor than that. And he looks so goofy in the bubble. And I'm like, come on, James, you're a much better actor than this. <laughs> I uh, think it's tough doing anything Wizard of Oz related because you have that touchstone, obviously, you know, the Judy Garland movie, that it's always going to kind of cast a shadow over anything you do. I remember seeing, like, pictures from... Wasn't there some horrible 1960s sequel to Wizard of Oz that someone did that was like super low budget and everything looked scary as all? Had, no, it was yeah. Disney. Was it Disney, really? Yeah. And, it's and not an animated one. This is like a live action yeah, one. Yeah, I liked it. And my niece, I took my niece, who's now like 37 with really? you know, four, three kids, four kids, and uh, she was crying. She wanted to leave the theater. I loved the movie, and I'm like, Please, honey, I want to stay and watch the movie, and we stayed. Were you but, uh, crying because it was terrifying? Or? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, right, so I'm not crazy. I was looking at, it was I Disney swear movie. I looked at, like, image search, and I was like, what is this? <laughs> I'll get these kids off Wizard of Oz one way or another. Make that pumpkin head guy really scary. Tap, tap, tap. I'm sorry. <laughs> Tin Man. <laughs> So uh, it might look unprofessional to people, but believe me, I'm just trying to be the engineer here as well. And I cannot, I cannot find the Facebook Live, but I know it's there. I don't have it either. Uh, so I, I've shared it with my page, but Adam Stone was out there, and, and it is up. It is actually up and running. Oh, and it's saying, it says that I shared it. Find it. Oh, I know why I can't find it. Why? Facebook plays a game on us. Did you know this? No. no. Oh, okay. You know how they say boost for five bucks? There's a way around it. It's a little tedious, okay? But, <laughs> and I can't, oh, there we go. So Give wait. us the Facebook. So there's the Facebook Live. Oh, there we are. Okay, so we're on Boston Free Radio, and I shared it. But here's the catch. When you go up to your Facebook and it says, um, friend, you can click that, and it will say, That's me. oh, okay, oh, I'm, I'm like, wow, space. <laughs> Red alert. <laughs> it's, uh, it says default or ad or something and that five dollars they want to charge you you can open up all your friends to get your posts first without paying that isn't that sneaky so uh yeah facebook has this little sneaky thing they're doing how dare you rip off the million dollar organization uh, <laughs> it's it's just insane because they just do so well why do they have to do that um i was looking forward to seeing all the little comments people piping in it's they can't find us. We're lost. You see the mayor, though. Oh, is this from this morning? Yeah, 60,000 people in Medford. Look at the crowd she drew. She, she really knows how to pack them in, huh? I, I, They're late I, sleepers I, in Medford, I, I know. It's all right. I, 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 it's just too funny. I don't want to get you guys in trouble. I'll do all the... Uh... But let's take Jack Douglas, the great producer. <laughs> Jack Douglas. See, so I've got friends following, right, and message, uh -huh. and more. And I think it's following. No, let's try more. Nope. Uh, I always want more. Why not? Yeah. He's a big Trump supporter. <laughs> Is he really? No, he hates <laughs> Trump. Jack Douglas? Yeah, he hates him. It's yes. great. Oh, it's great. So everyone's flocking to him. Uh, Sarcasm. I wouldn't say hate. I Sarcasm. would say... <laughs> I can't do it on the iPhone, but there is a way, people, and this is good for our audience to know. You go into your Facebook, and you can change the default so more people get you. So even though Boston Free Radio added me, yes, and even though I'm a moderator on the Boston Free Radio Facebook site, it's not showing up on my page, and I shared it. How does that happen? Um, oh, there it is now. It is now there. Okay, it's now showed up, and here we go. Uh, and we're plus two, and it's like uh, 62 views. Hey, all right. So um, <laughs> all you viewers out there, Gene Dante is playing at Sally O'Brien's, a great little room. PA's Lounge is great. And, and my point earlier was that Union Square is going to be bustling. Now, this is a big rumor. You know that post office across the street? Is that the post office that used to be the... Police station? Because it's no, like every brick building in Somerville used to be one of the police stations. The police station was there, and now it's over there. <laughs> but the, yeah, and there's well, yeah, right. And it's like the independent. But that uh, was the police station too, wasn't it? Like I'm, I'm telling you, there's like five police stations. Oh, eight cops, five stations. <laughs> well, I heard a rumor that that post <laughs> office <laughs> diagonal from us was right. purchased by a major concert promoter okay. who used to own the Paradise with the initials DL, hmm. and 
It just makes you think if the green line comes in, is he turning that into a concert venue? Why wouldn't you? You would absolutely do that. Doesn't it make sense? If you can get those, I mean, is it empty right now? Yeah. It was the post office, and what they did was they put the post office near Grooves. And there's Hub Comics. I'm going to interview those guys. Mm -hmm. They don't know it yet, but uh, I got their card. I went in there and told one of the employees, I want to have them on the air. Why not? Comic book store down the street, Grooves. So you come on the radio. There's all sorts of awesomeness going on here. There's a dance studio at the end of that street. You know where Midnight Variety is there? Mm -hmm. So if you go to the end of the street, upstairs was a dance studio in 72, 73, and that's where my band practiced. How fun. So I'm coming in today, I'm looking at it, you know, like all these years later. You know, it's like 44 years later, it's like, it's still there. Well, it's kind of neat. Um, but there's so much heritage here. So like, back to, you came in, in 2006, was it, the um, the Rumble? Oh, uh, 2009. 2009. The last WBCN Rumble before it just became the Rock and Roll Rumble. And where was it? Uh, it was at the Middle East downstairs. That was the finals. And, uh, we didn't win, but we were in the, we were finalists. And uh, so and who won? Uh, a band called The Luxury. Uh, they are not here now anymore. But See, so you should have won. My point... <laughs> Well, thanks. <laughs> I, I always had a point about the Rumble. I, I was like one of the only acts that said no to the Rumble. Really? And that did not sit well with BCN. Oh, that's too bad. But I felt like, okay, we have this album deal in France. I thought if you had a deal, you're not supposed to be in the Rumble. Oh, yeah. I, I w didn't know what the rules were. I mean, That was the rules. And we were on Career Records originally, and then Musidisc. We, were on RC we weren't on RCA. I signed Willie Loco Alexander to RCA in Europe. And then we flipped from RCA to Music Disc because Music Disc is bigger than RCA in Europe. Hmm. And it was better, but I'm on this major... I was on Career Records and then went to Music Disc. And it's like, uh, I have a deal. And you want to basically humiliate me and have someone win over me. I, I knew the score. You know, oh, here's this guy that's got some traction. So if we get someone to win, that gives them more of a, you know... And, and I just saw the writing. I said, no, and they were ripping. Uh, My records just didn't get played anymore. Uh, well, I think the track record for people that have won the Rumble kind of speaks for itself. Well, and, and there was one year when um, a band won, and everyone kind of knew the runner-up should have won, and it was political. And um, are these are we talking like years and years and years ago? Or? Yeah, we're talking yeah. the very beginning of it because um, and. You know, battles of the bands, I've been a judge before down in, and you know, it's cool, and you do your best judgment, and you try to block out any, uh, you know, personality conflicts with some of the people, and you just try to judge it on the music, and you do your honest best. Absolutely. But there's political ramifications, like in politics in Medford or uh, in the music scene, there's always going to be political ramifications. And one booking agent was just ripping, he goes, Joe, how does this help the scene? I said, I know, it was like... Um, a band from New England, but they, it wasn't like when I brought Girls' Night Out into the Paradise. I helped them get established at the Paradise where they became a headliner. The Neighborhoods, Unnatural Acts, they all came in on my shows. You know John, you know John Macy, Absolutely. Hummingbird Syndicate? Yeah. So John and I did this show December 2nd, 1978, where we had Willie Loco Alexander, our bands, and we had um, the Neighborhoods and Acts because they were do two songs in City Thrills with Barb Kitson, and all these bands that couldn't get in there on their own. They, the, those three bands became headliners at the Paradise, specifically because the Don Law Company was watching my shows, and they liked, and these backs, bands became headliners, the stoppers. I brought them into the Paradise. So when the, I talked to the Paradise, and they said, so you want a gig? And I, I said, I know Don Law allows local music. And they said, here's the thing. If you play a show and no one comes up, we're not going to book you again. It's business. And I said, I understand. It was Fred Johansson, real nice guy. I said, Fred, let me put my thinking cap on. I'll get back to you. My guitarist, Paul Lovell, Blowfish from Groupie News. All right, yeah. Oh, no, back in 78, yeah. So Fred Pino from the Atlantics and Paul Lovell, they might, I had a great band. And Fred and I still play together. So in, you know, 45 years later, we're still together, right? Whatever it is. Um... And Paul said, the Stompers have a draw. I put them in Cantones. They drew. So I called Fred back. I said, I'm going to put four bands on the bill. Nervous Rex, The Marshals. And we did about 200 people, and they were happy. So they gave me another date. December 2nd, 78, we had a line around the corner. We had Willie Loco, we had The Neighborhoods, and we, it was magic. 
was magic. We just put the show together. We, we put posters everywhere. John and I were in college campuses. We really worked it. And it worked. Just like, we, we, you know, we didn't know what we were doing. We just put a show together and it sold out. Good line around the corner. And that was like, whoa, that was, that was 1978. So we're talking 39 years ago. Yeah. So the paradise has been there over 40 years. So have you played the dice? Uh, no. <laughs> That's a good room for you. I played when, when they, the lounge used to have shows. I've played there, but uh, and I've emceed some events there for like uh, the nightclub Man Ray that has their reunions. I've uh, emceed some stuff for them there, but I haven't. Uh, the band hasn't played there yet. But uh, I was the first booking agent for Man Ray. Oh, get out! Really, I love Man. I put Rick Berlin in. Oh, Rick! Yay! Great. We're trying to get something together. We, we, I know that uh, it keeps. Slipping off the calendar, but I definitely want to play a show with Rick. I haven't seen him in a bit, and he's great. And uh, yeah, Man Ray was. Uh, I bartended there the last year they were open. So oh really? Yeah. I'm not as I'm not as young as I look, you know. But uh, it was a great venue. I mean, I, I'm so Chris Ewan from uh, Magnetic Fields and from um, uh, Figures on a Beach was our our lead DJ there. So and he's touring. I think Magnetic Fields is still touring. Right? Am I wrong? I don't know. I think they're off on the tour right now. I can, I don't know. With Keith Lockhart. Oh, I, yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, that, yeah. that would be a surprise. <laughs> I put Rick Berlin in Man Ray, who's perfect guy to open the room, right? Absolutely perfect with his cabaret and what he does, and it's just like perfect. And he, they get a phone call from a woman booking agent, a lesbian, and she's like, "You discriminate against women," and it's like, and she started putting shows in there, and I, I called her up and I said, "You know, I have a new club." Faces in Cambridge, and I have a contract with them, and so you cannot pull that you discriminate against women thing with my club. How mm -hmm. dare you infiltrate what I'm building? You know, and it's like the old, but I'm not mentioning any names, but that was the old days. Yeah, I mean, after having worked at uh, Man Ray, I at least when I was there, <laughs> that club did not do any discriminating against women. In fact, they celebrated them very highly. But you know, to, to, you know, it was just the the scene is like people can't we all get together? Let's work as a community, and that's I think Mickey Bliss and Boston Free Radio certainly. I think we have that community thing now. No, oh, that's great. Because, yeah. like I said to Heather, this door is open to everyone. Yeah. You and I had never met. No, this is our first time meeting. That's I don't even, Do you know that Gene's a double threat? He also acts here in this town. And oh, once in a while. Did you know that? Yeah. Yeah. No, and just you know that PR guy. <laughs> yeah, I am a PR He jogs my memory when I but don't you, talk about myself enough. <laughs> but you work with Rob Thomas. I'm here to help. <laughs> How'd you hook up with Rob Thomas? I was basically off the road. I, when I get out of playing, Joe, I started uh, teching for people. John Butcher was the guy, my first guy. Dear friend. Yeah, love John Butcher. We've added his records. Should we play one? If you got one up, keep one up. He's great. We've got 17 minutes to talk on radio and TV, and then we shut the Facebook off and the TV off. But we're live on Summerville TV right now. Great. Well, hi, Summerville. It's your first time on Summerville TV? It is, um, aside from possible security cameras. So, yeah, this will be my first time. What, what, what um, Dan has to do is take a look at the board behind us and find other shows for you to be on, like uh, Chris Haskell's great. Uh, so Chris Haskell does the Villains Den at 5 o'clock okay. on Thursdays. So, um, I'm going to get you to play the acoustic guitar. We can talk, 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 but I'd like to hear something. And Chris Haskell does live stuff in here. Oh, great. That's great. Yeah. But, um, people, we've never done a live show, so this is our virgin territory. And, Should uh, I go grab a guitar? You guys talk about something. Dan fixes all and uh, is one of the greatest luthiers I've ever met, and that's how we became good friends, because he uh, takes care of all the equipment that I get to play, which is awesome, and, uh, and uh, my guitar players as well, so... Keeps us in good shape when we're lucky enough to have him. I mean, when he's not on tour. You just mentioned Fred Pinnell from the Atlantics. Yeah, he's. I just sold him a guitar, great guitar, more than I made. When? Uh, a couple months ago. He says he's liking it, so that would come back to me. Fred's a dear friend. Fred's uh, wonderful. I've known him since '74, and it, so Reaction was the band, and we were in Electroacoustic Studio. So do you know why? Connie St. Pierre sent me a birthday note for Monday. I remember her. So, Connie, um, do you know why they moved to Maine, Bethel, Maine? I do not. So, you remember us being in the studio there, though, right? Electroacoustic was right over in Bay Village. Yes. Jocks. Absolutely. 
so you get this married couple that owns this studio, and the drag queens that come out at night have knife fights. Oh, yeah. As Jacques. Jacques, the only club that has to shut down at midnight, right, in town. Yeah. Park Square was a different place back then. Uh, and David Bowie went to the other side. Yeah. What a great place. For, he was with the, the Sidewinders, I think. I was at his show in 73, 72. They had billboards up. David Bowie is Ziggy Stardust. Ziggy Stardust is David Bowie. And I went to the Muse Expo convention in 1980 down in Florida, and I was in the elevator with an RCA Records guy, and they said, man, I want to see promo like you did for Bowie. He goes, Jack Green. We're going to do it for Jack Green. And, uh, okay, so it's nine, it's 2017, and do you remember posters for Jack Green like you saw for Bowie? Yeah, vaguely. Yeah. What I do remember, and I was telling Gene about this the other day, was uh, Charlie Linsky and I going to that house in Woburn where Direct Tire is now and get to the basement and watching you play with your band. Rehearsal. Did you live in that house in the corner of Washington Street and Woburn down there? It's not Direct Tire. Oh, is there? it? Tom, that tire place is down on the hill, but on that corner was a house. Yeah, and Third and Dragon Court. Yeah. Yeah, that's, you know, I felt badly that, um, you know, we should have purchased it, but it would have, they would have bought it from us because they wanted to tear it down. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, it was uh, Lady Carolyn and Lord Manuel found the house, and so remember Lord Manuel? I, I remember them both. It was so much fun. Well, Carolyn's still in the band with Fred and I. Oh, cool. So you've got people from, you know, Fred and I played in 74, Carolyn joined the band in 77, 78, uh, so we go back a long time, we do a little retribute now, but the thing is about the house, um, Manuel passed away in 2013. Did you know that? No. So Manuel's gone. A French record label got a hold of me. They want to put out a Lord Manuel vinyl album. So the family just agreed. We've been going back and forth by email. So there will be a Lord Manuel French album out there in a few months. And that's exciting news. And it you good. heard it first. But we're going to hear at 2.17 of the p.m. We get 13 minutes left. We're going to hear Gene Dante live. Yeah. And I'm going to use, I'm going to shut up and put my mic over here to get the guitar in him. Oh, great. Yeah, and move nice. the Facebook live. On the old. And we got Gene Dante live at Boston Free Radio. False expectations, empty train stations, scenery and moon, all shades of grey. That's in the cellar, broken umbrellas on the subway during a
nice. Do you want to do another one? We have, um, on TV, we have nine minutes left. Oh, should we close that with a little uh, acoustic? What did, Dan, which one do you think? Should... Mm. You have an opinion either way? Well, you also do acoustic stuff, so pick one of your faves from there. Like a cover or like that? Well, it's been a while since you've done an acoustic show. Well, let's do, uh, should do Madison's Method. You didn't play that one. So. Sure. Uh, Gene Dante, we've got um, four minutes and 15 seconds left of visual radio, then we go back to the pop explosion, although this is the pop explosion, you're on radio and TV, you like the trinal caps? It's a bit confusing, I feel a little surrounded, but I like it. It's, um, hey, you know, that you, I think you sounded good, but we'll find, I mean, <laughs> you were good, you, you performed well, 
Oh! What, what happened? Black Sabbath will not be silenced. No, but that's okay. We didn't play enough of them to upset people. Uh, I love Black Sabbath, meaning, meaning that we, we don't play that on TV. We don't play it on Facebook. Uh, but Facebook Live is amazing. We have it. And uh, So do you, will you take the video, if you like it, and chop it up and put it out on... I could. If you're, hey, if you guys are giving me permission to do it, of course I'd love to. Yeah, you have my blessing. Now, do you know how to take, Dan, do you know how to take video off of Facebook Live? Uh, we have people that do that. We'll so figure it out. What, I, it took me weeks, months, but I finally, because I go down to Cantab and I videotape the bands. You go to m.facebook.com, the mobile, and then you find the video and you hit the video and you can now save the video. You can't do it in www. Ah, oh, so it's a mobile only. Yeah, that's cool. But that's okay, as long as we can save the videos. You're like a, a wealth of Facebook hacks, and I like it. Um, These kids could learn a thing or two. Hey, you beat out the mayor. She can't draw, <laughs> you outdraw her. We got more people here than she had at her luncheon. That uh, just goes to show you, I've got a lot more people that don't fucking work. Oops, you said that don't oh, work. Oh, <laughs> Did I just oops, say it? Oops. Can you beat me? <laughs> a little difficult after the fact. Uh, <laughs> hey, it's been an hour since I've said anything. <laughs> no, but Sorry. you were just talking about George Parliament, George Parliament's Funkadella. Funk. Uh, they, they, they're funking. They're not working. No, they <laughs> hey, he, I heard him. He said funking. And Donald Trump will agree. Don't, what do you think about this whole... <laughs> Nixon thing going on. Yeah. They're gonna bounce this guy, right? It's just a matter of time. I think that for somebody who has been calling for quote extreme vetting of immigrants, first off, I'm not saying it is. Oh, I like that. that. I like what but, you're saying. But you're somebody going. who who has been calling for that can't stand to be extreme vetted, and he's the leader of our country. I'm not taking your word for anything. You're responsible for millions of lives and millions of dollars of federal money. I, I'm sorry, you should be extremely vetted, and you should be investigated constantly. I, I don't see a problem with that, and I'm so, and, and all right, maybe you have the right to fire whoever you want, but you know what? Then the Senate and the Congress need, and the House of Representatives need to appoint an independent counsel. I don't care who you voted for. I would have, I would say the same thing about uh, if Hillary Clinton were president or if Bernie Sanders were president or Barack Obama. I, I don't care. You, if you, especially if you're an advocate for extreme vetting of immigrants, of which this nation is founded, then you yourself must submit to such extreme vetting and investigation. That's all. And on May 13th, you're going to hear <laughs> Dante and, and I. <laughs> Sorry. May 13th. And as your elected official, I would welcome any investigation into my uh, business dealings, of which you will find none. <laughs> so May 13th at, um, at the uh, Sally O'Brien's here in Union Square, lovely Union Square, Gene Dante is going to be performing. This is Visual Radio, uh, copyright 2017, Joe Vig. All rights preserved, like RuPaul's hairdo. And uh, we've got John Forsyth with us the, from Charlie's Angels, and Gene Dante <laughs> and myself. And John is uh, channeling Dan Murphy. Secretly. The voice. The Forgot voice. To mention, thanks so much for having us. Yes, John. Thank you very much for having us on board. You both have distinctive voices. I'd like him to be a DJ here. Dude, Dan, Dan is an excellent voice. Yeah, he does. Voice. It's unique. Let's do it. All right, so a uh, new DJ for Boston Fury. We got a full board there. He's great. We can do a live thing from the road as I tour around. And um, that's our show, and we're back on radio. Okay, and we're going to go off Facebook Live right now. Thank you.